the Emperor Hadrian was an intellectual, a builder, and a lover. He ruled the Roman Empire from AD 117 to AD 138 between the reigns of Trajan and Antoninus Pius. He delineated the empire, he built his own villa at Tivoli, he built the Pantheon in Rome, he rebuilt and founded several cities, and he achieved peace in Parthia, Dacia, and Judea. He was an unusual emperor, refusing to extend the reach of the Roman Empire, loving another man explicitly, and having a great interest in Greek literature, which earned him the nickname Graeculus, the Greekling. He is best known to us by his solid legacy that has lasted 2,000 years, a wall stretching 80 miles across Britain, Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall formed a northern frontier, but there were several outposts beyond it, including Habitancum and Bromenium, which are now known as High Rochester and Risingham. This is Hausted's Fort, known in Roman times as Vercovicum. There were mile castles stationed regularly along Hadrian's Wall, and every so often there would be a major fort, like this one. Hadrian's Wall was built in the early 2nd century AD, around the 120s, by three legions. The 2nd Legion Augusta, the 6th Victrix, and the 20th Valeria Victrix. Each legion was allotted different mile castles to build, and this approach holds the secret to finding out exactly how the logistics of building the wall worked. There are many different theories about why the wall was built. Professor Hingley of Durham University can tell us more about it. We have no Roman text that tells us that soldiers or Britons fought from the ramparts and fought off attack. There's a very powerful image of Hadrian's Wall, which has been popular right through time, that Hadrian's Wall is actually a defensive structure built to keep people out of the province. Now, one thing that's very important on all modern frontiers is surveillance. So, you know, you have this structure which, on which you can stand and observe, or you can stand close by and observe from watchtowers what's going on in the surrounding landscape. That may be a very important element of your defensive function of your wall, because you need to know if people are massing the other side of it, or even behind you, perhaps, um, in the case of Hadrian's Wall. The majority of the time, the chances are the Roman army hold down the landscape quite effectively. Hadrian's Wall had two parts to its structure, the main curtain wall and the vallum. The vallum was a huge ditch placed south of the wall, the function of which is still unknown. The wall and the vallum are two completely different structures, effectively. For a long time in the past, until the early 20th century, it was actually thought that they were two different frontier systems on very much a similar line, but the vallum runs um, between about half a kilometre and about 50 metres behind the curtain wall. And it's like a separate line of um, defensive earthworks, but it is a demarcation. The dominant explanation is that it was built to define a sort of military enclosure. So built to stop people from the south actually coming into the area of the forts and the fortlets and the mile castles along the back of Hadrian's Wall. The wall was faced with cut stone coated in plaster and whitewashed. The core was made out of a mixture of rubble and clay. Mortar was only used on the mile castle. The wall certainly served as a symbol of Roman power, uniting Roman soldiers from several different nationalities onto one project. Professor Burley can tell us more about the internationalism and the different religions of the soldiers stationed at the wall. There's the Tungrians from Belgium who were here as well, and later on Hausteds, the Batavians from, from the Netherlands, of whom there was a regiment at Karabruff. Then you've got other Gallic regiments named after specific Gallic tribes or peoples, the Lingonese, for example, from Long, um, the Aquitanians from Southwest. There's even one regiment based at Newcastle in the later period of Cornovians from what is now around. Uh, the Wirral, uh, Shropshire and so on. It's the only named uh, regiment of a British people. Um, otherwise the regiments of Britons were sent overseas. Uh. The different nationalities of soldiers at Hadrian's Wall brought different religions with them. Here we have a temple to the cult of Mithras, which was um, a cult to the Eastern Sun God. This was very popular in ancient Rome in the AD 120s and Hadrian himself actually got initiated into the cult of Mithras. 
many of the soldiers are, are simply worshipping traditional deities and obviously there are official dedications to Jupiter, best and greatest, you know, the chief god of the, the official Roman pantheon. There's also, as discovered a few years ago here, um, Jupiter Dolichinus, who is a sort of eastern variant that the soldiers came across when serving in the east in the time of Trajan. It seems a very powerful, originally Hittite weather god, uh, who was thought to be all-powerful. And on the altar we found here, he's he's shown in his traditional pose, standing on a bull with, with an, an axe, you know, showing he's, he's a great powerful deity. The soldiers like that. There's Mithras, obviously, who is um, ostensibly a Persian god, although the form he was worshipped in, 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 in the Roman Empire seems to have been a, a Roman invention. They sort of, sort of welded some characters welded together these Persian ideas and produced this mystery cult. Yeah, the, there's a big variety. And then, you know, gradually Christianity creeps in, but there's hardly any trace of it uh, in, in the forts because um, inscriptions basically peter out in the 4th century anyway when Christianity obviously really starts becoming important. This little altar was found in April uh, during the excavations, reused just as a building stone. You see it's quite small. Um, it's it's a nice design and it's probably, if not mass produced, I mean produced by a local altar salesman um, for the interested person to do their own dedication, their own writing, because it, it's practically the same pattern as one in the museum to a completely different deity. In this case it's dedicated to a very traditional sounding Roman god Apollo, god of the arts, of uh, all sorts of other things including the plague, but um, quite likely identified by local soldiers with a Celtic goddess, god, Maponus. Dr David Petz, who organises the excavation of Binchester, can tell us more about the internationalism of the soldiers stationed here. The Roman Empire obviously is a very big international body and the army was, was part of that, so not surprisingly we've been finding evidence of trade links some some distance we've had um amphora which are big storage vessels and they probably storing wine or olive oil or even roman fish sauce and they probably came from spain or uh, north africa we don't i don't think we've got any from the east mediterranean we've got pottery from central france from central gaul uh, stuff called terra sigillata which is very fine uh, fine wear with a very nice red sheen on it um we've got material from the north of France, we've got stuff from Germany, mainly pottery types. Our glass, some of it is probably produced locally, but some of it may well have been imported from probably the Western Empire, more generally speaking. Um, but also we've got evidence for um, links with uh, pottery and traded goods just coming from elsewhere within the, the province of Britain. So you've got lots of uh, pottery from Dorset, lots of pottery from Essex, lots of pottery from Yorkshire, and then stuff probably made even more locally. So really you can see the, the fort drawing on supplies from you know, locally, regionally, and then internationally. Now you found something very significant a couple of days ago. Can you tell us about it, please? Yes, you got this rather nice um, carved Roman head from our probable bathhouse building. Um, it's, it's typical of uh, Romano, British, Romano Celtic style stone carving. Um, there's some very similar heads like this from from the north of England, there's particularly a uh, head from a fort called Benwell on Hadrian's Wall. Here we are at Binchester Fort, known in Roman times as Venovia. Now the auxiliary units that were stationed here were from all over the ancient world. We think we've, have, we've got one from North Africa and one from Pannonia, even a small unit from a local town, Chesterley Street. The Roman idea of race was very different to the way it is today. Whether you had Romanitas, Roman citizenship, was much more important than your physical appearance. Roman auxiliary soldiers were granted Roman citizenship by the emperors and were therefore allowed to marry a non-Roman wife. Retired soldiers were honourably discharged from the army. Therefore, most of the soldiers here at Binchester would have had full Roman rights and citizenship. Hadrian's Wall still affects the life of the surrounding areas. Towns have since grown up around what used to be major forts. After it fell into disuse, Hadrian's Wall turned into a very useful local quarry for the villages around the wall. Here, in the crypt of Hexham Abbey, we've got an inscription from the wall which tells us that uh, Septimius Severus, who was the emperor who came to rebuild the wall in AD 208, 
dedicated a granary with his son's Caracalla Regatta. Here, in the side of the crypt, we've got some, um, some more stones from the side of the wall, which show leaf designs and patterns. Down here, just at the top of this, uh, of this archway, we've got another inscription. This is almost even more important than the inscription back there from the Emperor Septimius Severus because it shows us one of the legions that built the wall and came over from the mainland with the Emperor Hadrian in order to build Hadrian's wall. Our ancient sources give us an idea of Hadrian's personality. A tall and imposing figure, extremely fit, elegant, with a full beard. His eyes were supposed to be bright and piercing. He was pleasant and charming, but he had insatiable ambition and intellectual curiosity. You know, there's this famous story, uh, he, he even liked to reckon he was better on, on questions of, of, of grammar and, and, and syntax and, and Latin literature and everything. And uh, at one of these literary soirees, uh, he had an argument with one of the, the intellectuals of the day who uh, gave in and said, oh yes, of course, you're right, Emperor. And when the Emperor then left, his friends turned to this chap and said, hey, why on earth did you say he was right? Because he, he wasn't right, you were right. And he said, who am I to argue with the Lord of 30 Legions? Other Emperors were known to have made decisions about city architecture, but Hadrian took it one step further. He may even have been responsible for designing some of the unique features of the wall. Hadrian, we know, was in Britain around the time the wall was built. We don't quite know how long he was in Britain. And actually, if you start looking at Hadrian's wall in great detail, although it is fairly systematic in concept, in detail it varies a lot. So there's a lot of variation along the line of the wall. And I think the, the easiest explanation for Hadrian's wall really is that Hadrian does have a direct input into its planning and construction initially. But, you know, Hadrian won't and come back to Britain. So then the Roman army and the sort of people who are commanding the construction of individual sections may have a slightly more independence to change and vary the way the wall's constructed. After Hadrian's project in Britain, he extended the boundaries of the empire around Libya, travelling the length and breadth of the lands he commanded. In Antioch, while he was on his travels, he met a young man, Antinous who was to change his life. Their love story is one of the most poignant in history. Although the boy was only 17, he accompanied the emperor everywhere, including his trip to Athens to restore the city. But on their tour of Egypt, Antinous mysteriously drowned in the Nile. The emperor was devastated. Another blow followed, revolts in Judea left the Roman army and their commander exhausted. Hadrian returned to Rome, a sick, hardened and weary man, and retired to the stunning villa he had built for himself at Tivoli, outside Rome. It is thought that he wrote this sad little poem in the last few days of his life. Little soul, little wanderer, little charmer, guest and companion of the body, where are you off to now? to darkling, cold, and gloomy places, and you won't make your customary jokes. The Emperor Hadrian was the only Roman Emperor to leave such a permanent mark on Britain. After his initial setting of the northern boundary of his empire, the Emperor Septimius Severus was the next Emperor to return to Britain in AD 208 and rebuild Hadrian's work. But Hadrian's legacy stretched around the ancient world he defined the boundaries of his empire in a way that no emperor had done before. This man was a visionary. Although he was criticised and even sometimes despised by his Roman contemporaries for his reluctance to expand the empire beyond its capabilities or for his love of Greek literature and culture, Hadrian left us with a deep and lasting impression of a bygone but golden era of progress and organisation that has taken us more than 1,000 years to restore to the same level. Hadrian's Wall.